Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's mini collecting deep dive, I want to take you back to a time just before Waterworld's premiere, a time when the film's public relations team was fully gearing up for an approaching summer of 1995 release and preparing a marketing smorgasbord for an eager but perhaps skeptical movie-going audience. So without further ado, let's look at not one but two Waterworld press kits to see just how much effort went into shaping the perception of this film before it even hit theaters. But first, what is a press kit? Well, a press kit, sometimes known as a media kit, is a set of documents, traditionally photographs and written materials, that is sent to media outlets as a part of a project's promotional push. Now, the idea of a press kit extends far beyond the film industry, with press kits being used in everything from product and company launches to the announcement of special events, but for sure, some of the most exciting examples of press kits are from the film industry, which attempts to distill the essence of a film down into printed form with information that will acquaint as many people within the media and industry with the project as possible. And yeah, this is exactly the purpose of the first press kit we'll be looking at today, what we'll be calling the theatrical press kit. And as you can see, all of the materials have been arranged together in this very simple but elegant folder with the Mariner over Setting Sun image and the Universal Studios logo underneath, surrounded by an all black border and back cover. But opening up the folder, we have two sleeves filled with materials. Let's first take a look at these on the left side. So here we have two booklets, production information and cast and crew. The production information booklet is actually pretty girthy with about 20 pages detailing the production of the film and another 15 pages of biographical information about the movie making professionals that created Waterworld with five of those pages just dedicated to producers. Yeah, Waterworld was famously a pretty producer heavy project. But regardless, this reads a lot like a truncated version of the making of Waterworld book, taking the reader through the pre-production process of casting and building all the sets, props, and costumes, and then details the undertaking of principal photography and creating the film's many VFX shots. And as we know, the production of Waterworld was an extremely arduous one, but it's interesting how this marketing document really endeavors to spin this into something to be proud of, something that was overcome by the crew by reinforcing how the movie broke new ground in all areas of filmmaking, of course giving special attention to the unique fact that it was almost entirely shot on water, something that had really never been done up until that point. But the positive spin on things even goes further than that, as we can see here in the opening pages, which gives a synopsis of the film that really paints the Mariner as a large heroic figure in the picture, rather than the anti-hero we actually see in the movie, even going as far as saying he's the Atoller's one hope, and that he sits out with a beautiful woman and a mysterious little girl in search of a new beginning, which is a real exaggeration of his motives considering the actual plot of the film. But going back to the production of the film, the booklet also talks about how Waterworld was a difficult undertaking not only for the unstable nature of shooting on water, but because of the ever-changing quality of light while shooting at sea. Yeah, it's important to keep in mind that Waterworld almost completely relied on natural lighting for its principal photography, and with such long setup times for each shot, the constantly changing light between the sky and the water made maintaining visual continuity a nightmare. And you can really tell this weighed on the director of photography, Dean Semler, who I believe felt he had to be constantly making compromises just to keep the production moving forward. But I think overall, Waterworld pulls it off because Semler seemed to know which shots counted the most, and in the end, these are really the images that stick in your mind even after the movie is over. And I was also surprised to see that the documents even addressed the film's negative preconceived attitudes by the press, even glowing this up by saying that the bad media made everyone on set work even harder to produce a successful film. Now, I have to say, most of the details about the production in this booklet I've already gone over in my previous deep dives. However, there were a few new details that I've not seen written about anywhere else. Three things specifically that I found of interest were Number one, 
this whole paragraph talking about how it was Dennis Hopper's own decision to shave his head to prepare for the role of the deacon. Number 2. This section that describes the Trimoran's fantastical equipment which mentions that it has a solar-powered glue gun for repairs. And this detail is so specific that it makes me wonder if there was a deleted scene that actually showed this mysterious feature. And number three. Here it has a pull quote from Costner himself saying that the shells for the Mariner's earrings were actually found by his daughters. A nice little personal touch, I have to say. So moving on to the second booklet, we basically just have a printed version of the credits scroll from the end of the film. And for me, it's been nice to have this in my collection just as a piece of reference material so that I can quickly look up cast and crew names. But beyond that, nothing too much to note here besides on page 16, which mentions the shark animation sequence, which you'll remember I talked in depth about in my video on the Deacon action figure, because it of course comes packed with a mutant hunter shark. However, here is a very brief recap for new viewers. There was a computer generated sequence with the Deacon releasing tracker sharks to follow the Trimoran after it escapes from the barter outpost, but this was almost entirely scrapped from the final cut of the film apart from a brief glimpse of two fins passing underneath the Trimoran while Helen and the Mariner are exploring the underwater city. But I just wanted to make a final note on this story as I recently uncovered a few articles from Entertainment Weekly, the LA Times, and People Magazine all talking about audiences' reactions to some of the early test screenings of Waterworld, and lo and behold, they all reported people feeling displeased with the shark sequence, saying it looked fake. Now, to the VFX artist's defense, I believe the sequence was still a work in progress and what appeared in the early cut of the film was sort of a placeholder for the final animations, which I don't think the test audiences understood at the time. But yeah, just to put a button on this, these articles confirmed that the tracker shark sequence did exist in some partially completed state, but to this day, no videos or images have ever surfaced of it, and it remains lost media. Now turning back to the full press kit, let's have a look at the materials in this other sleeve. Here we have some things of more visual interest, starting with this document called Color Identifications, which lists some catalog numbers and descriptions which correspond with color slides that are attached to the back of the sheet in this plastic sleeve holder. From my research, slides were often included with press kits to give theaters or the press some visual materials to include with any publicity or advertisements in preparation for the film's release. In today's world, these would of course be digital image files. And the slides included with this press kit are images that you will have undoubtedly seen if you have any familiarity with Waterworld and its marketing. The slides are reinforced on cardboard frames and are printed with some information, including the photographer's name, Ben Glass. And if we look at the credits booklet, we can see that Ben Glass held the position of still photographer on the crew of Waterworld. Now this is a pretty interesting role on a film crew that I was not aware of until the writing of this video, but a still photographer or on set or unit still photographer is a person whose sole role is to create high quality photographs to be used for the press and publicity of a film. It actually sounds like a pretty sweet gig and now that I'm looking at these, I strongly suspect that Ben Glass was responsible for the images that we see on the FLIR Ultra trading cards that I covered in a previous video, which were all from alternative angles and takes than what was shot and put into the final cut of the movie. And apart from the color slides, this press kit also has five black and white photo sheets printed on this glossy cardstock. Again, these images are probably familiar to fans, but it is really exciting to see these pictures in person on actual photographic paper. Each sheet has a description, and again, they are credited as the work of Ben Glass. But unfortunately, this press kit is missing some images. I believe there may have been as many as a dozen in a full kit. Regardless though, I could totally see a collector framing and hanging these photos as wall decorations because of just how high quality they are. 
And yeah, those are all the items in the Waterworld Theatrical Press Kit. I think the entire package is really classy, if not lacking a bit in personality. I think it would have been nice to see a little bit more of the film's mysterious allure come through in the overall presentation. So with that said, I think I really saved the more exciting press kit to look at second. Allow me to introduce you to the Waterworld Merchandising Press Kit. Now, right from the get-go, you can see that we're getting something really fresh here with this bold underwater texture and triangular Waterworld logo. And this folder only gets cooler because it opens up to reveal a glorious face-off between the Deacon and the Mariner with the Atoll and Trimoran in the background, an image which you may recognize from the start screen of the Super NES Waterworld game. And get this, it actually unfolds again to reveal the Atoll Lagoon completely engulfed in battle with Helen and Enola on the left, the Mariner on the right, and the film's title emblazoned in the middle. And you'll probably recognize this image from various Waterworld marketing and tie-in merchandise, but of course, it was most famously the same image used on the very noxious smelling plastic banner from my Waterworld Video Store promo collection. On the back of the folder is the film's cast and a description of the characters they are portraying. And doesn't it feel like R.D. Call, who plays the Atoll Enforcer, should be displayed in this empty space right here? Uh, but regardless, check out the borders around each of the characters' headshots. It appears they are the same designs that were used for the promotional chit keychains that I covered in a previous collecting video. But now that we've had a look at this real showstopper of a folder, let's have a peek at the contents within, which slides out of this sort of box-like pocket in the back of the portfolio. Here we have 25 document sheets that contain all sorts of information and color images, and glancing over these, we can start to see this is actually more like a style guide that shows potential companies creating tie-in merchandise how to approach designing their products to exist within Waterworld's intellectual property. First, we have a handful of text documents that delve out the film's premise, information about the cast and crew, and the marketing position that the film aims to take with audiences. And speaking of audiences, you can tell from this section titled Target Audience that Waterworld was really hoping for a very broad appeal, aiming to a wide age group of 10 to 49 years old, saying that teenagers specifically will be attracted to the action and visual effects. This section also goes into quite a bit of detail about how the film will be alluring to both men and women, saying the classic action story will appeal to men, while women will respond to the Mariner's reluctant friendship with Helen and Enola, a statement I personally think is a bit of a stretch considering the Mariner's coarse conduct through most of the movie. But in any case, this document also claims that Kevin Costner himself will be a powerful draw for both men and women, which I guess at the time was an accurate statement with Costner having a string of hits leading up to Waterworld and being seen as a bit of a Hollywood darling back in the early 90s. And yeah, these documents really pump up the heroic stature of Costner and his character, the Mariner, calling him a traditional hero and a hero for all times, which seems, in my opinion, inconsistent with the loner survivalist that we see for most of the film's runtime. I feel these documents are much more realistic about Dennis Hopper's depiction of the Deacon, calling him one of cinema's villains you love to hate. But in this section called Key Selling Points, I think they really nail the appeal of Waterworld, emphasizing the unprecedented size and scope of the project, and of course pointing out that all the action uniquely takes place on water. It even gives us a whole section on the construction of the Atoll, a section on the Mariner's Trimoran, and even a section specifically on the prop firearms used in the movie. These documents also like to stress that Waterworld is an event movie, comparing it to Jurassic Park and the Flintstones. Another selling point I enjoyed was this section pointing out the film's compelling environmental message for the 1990s. And how about this nicely written line? A future where humanity's greatest hopes and darkest nightmares become reality. I actually think this really nicely sums up the undertones of the film. 
But yeah, in any case, let's check out these image documents which give us a real roadmap for how Waterworld products and packaging should look. Here we have a sheet showing us the Waterworld logo and borders, which of course are silhouetted skylines of the atoll that we've seen on all kinds of Waterworld merchandise like the board game and action figures. These documents even give us official Waterworld textures to use, which appear to be from different costumes, set pieces, and even Enola's doodles, which I specifically recall seeing in the new stage screens of the Waterworld Game Boy game. These documents also give us the official Waterworld font set, known as Hiroshige, along with more logos in different sizes and color options. Then we get into more photographs and again, I strongly suspect these are the work of Ben Glass. The collection of images includes photographs of all the main cast including this picture of the Hellfire Gunner that I don't recall seeing anywhere else, as well as images of the Atoll and Trimoran, with this snapshot of the Atoll gates that actually shows the underwater support beams that held that section of the set together. And some of the other photographs you will most certainly recognize, like this image of a smoker that ended up on the cover of the Waterworld Pinball Owner's Manual and also on the side of the machine itself, or this image of the open atoll gates which became the box art for the Waterworld PC game. But interestingly, neither of these images are in the film, really showing how a still photographer on set can shape our perception of a movie without even having any of their work in the actual cut of the film. And yeah, I love this merchandising press kit. It really pops with personality, especially when compared with the theatrical press kit we looked at first. I mean, I think the folder itself is a priceless piece of Waterworld collecting, and that's not even to mention all the documents that give you this really interesting inside look to how Universal Studios was positioning the film from a marketing perspective. And there you have it. That is my look at the Waterworld press kits. And if you've been following my channel for a while, you know I love to study all of the different Waterworld promotional items and merchandise. So it's just interesting to look at these two sets of documents that set so much of the tone and style for all of the materials that surrounded this film. So I hope you enjoyed this little collecting deep dive as much as I did creating it. On a completely different note, thank you so much to everyone's continued support of the channel. We actually surpassed our end of the year goal of 2,000 subscribers back in November, doubling our subscriber count in just about a year's time. So here's to another year aboard the Atoll, though I have to say the work is far from over as I still have many videos planned for the future. So stay tuned because I still feel the best has yet to come. So cheers to that as well. But anyways, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and say hello in the comments before you go. That kind of stuff really helps with the channel as well. Also, check out the Atoll on Instagram for even more Waterworld content, updates on new videos, or to reach out to me personally. Link in the description. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll.